Hi viewers, in this video I will show you how I use the vacuum pump to bleed the non-ABS portion of the braking system on my Jeep Patriot. To begin, the vehicle was parked on an even surface and ready to be jacked up. Before bleeding the brakes, I used my scan tool to check if there was any ABS struggle codes stored in the system. There was none, so it was fine to bleed the non-ABS portion of the braking system. The main reason for not bleeding the ABS portion of the braking system was because I did not have the proper bidirectional scan tool. The bleeding wheel circuit sequence for the Jeep Patriot is the following. 1. The left rear wheel. 2. The right front wheel. 3. The right rear wheel. 4. The left front wheel. For basic safety, I positioned the four wheel chucks to secure the wheels located on the opposite side of any wheel that was removed. On top of that, to make the working area safer, I used more than one jack stand to stabilize the vehicle. To be well prepared, I made sure to have multiple 8mm tools to undo the bleeder screws. I also had plenty of DOT3 brake fluid. This fluid is dangerous, so it's important to follow the instructions written in the owner's manual and on the label of the brake fluid bottle. Normally I prefer to work with a helper that pumps the brake pedal, but I was alone on that day. That's why I use my vacuum pump to bleed the brakes. In theory, bleeding the brakes with a vacuum pump seems easy as shown. The vehicle is safely jacked up. The wheel is removed. The lid of the fluid reservoir is loosened to check the level and to let the air in. A pan is placed on the floor under the bleeder screw. The vacuum bleeding kit is installed and connected to the bleeder screw. A basic vacuum is applied with the pump. Then, using an 8mm wrench, the bleeder screw is opened. The vacuum can be kept between 15 and 25 inches of mercury while the brake fluid is pumped out of the braking system. During the procedure, the jar is kept higher than the bleeder screw to siphon out the brake fluid and the air bubbles from the system. When around two thirds and three quarters of the jar is filled up with brake fluid, the bleeder screw is closed. Then the vacuum is released. Without vacuum, it's easy to unscrew the lid, then empty the jar. Every time this procedure is done, the fluid in the master cylinder reservoir should not be lower than the fill mark. New brake fluid must also be added up to the full mark. Every time this procedure is repeated, the brake fluid collected into the small jar becomes lighter and fresher. Depending on the order of the bleeding wheel sequence, this procedure can be done from 2 to 5 times per wheel. As soon as the quality of brake fluid reaches a light or very light yellow with a translucent appearance, the vacuum kit can be removed. The remaining fluid in the clear hose should also be collected. Again, brake fluid is added in the reservoir. I always check the brake pedal after each wheel has been done. If the pedal is spongy when pressing it down, the wheel brake has to be rebled. When the brake bleeding of a wheel is completed, the bleeder screw should be tightened to specs and the rubber plug refitted. This was a fast and simplified version to bleed the brakes with a vacuum tool. But in reality, the bleeder screws of my drum brakes were completely rusted and seized. First, I had to use a small wire brush to remove most of the rust. Then, I sprayed a bit of penetrating fluid to lubricate the threads. Only when the rust was removed from the surface of the bleeder screw, I was able to insert an 8mm socket. At first, I tried to loosen the bleeder screw, but I was unable to do it. It took time to loosen it, but I did avoid stripping the threads and the hexagonal flanks. Moving the handle back and forth helped reduce the friction between the threads. After, I sanded the head of the bleeder screw to get a better seal with the vacuum hose. Overall, I was satisfied because I didn't have to replace any bleeder screw when bleeding the four-wheel brake circuits. 
I tried some vacuum adapters, but none of them worked properly. Only the clear hose was fitting properly. The problem with the drum brakes was that the two bolts holding each brake cylinder were preventing the wrench from moving freely. The solution was to undo the bolt on the rear side. When the bleeding was completed, I refastened the bolt and I tightened it to specs. The front brakes were more problematic because sometimes the air was entering between the threads and air bubbles were showing in the hose. Different ways to seal the threads can be used. But at that moment, I simply tightened the bleeder screw a little more and I reduced the vacuum level to lower the ratio of air in the fluid being transferred in the jar. As long as there is a constant vacuum applied when the jar is higher than the bleeder screw, the air going through the threads or around the head of the bleeder screw doesn't get in the braking system. But on the other hand, it makes it difficult to see if bubbles are coming from inside the braking system when different sources of bubbles are present. At the beginning of the job, I always use more brake fluid to bleed the first wheel because the fluid in the master cylinder reservoir has to be renewed. As reference, I had to bleed around 16 ounces of brake fluid when I worked on the first brake. But when I bled the last brake, I only needed around 4 ounces. Later, when the brake bleeding job was completed, I did a road test. I tried the brakes in different road conditions and they worked properly. Once back home, I washed the vacuum kit components. First, I removed most of the fluid with a rag. Then I used brake cleaner to remove small traces of brake fluid. Finally, I washed them again with water and soap to decontaminate them for any future usage. Whenever I'm bleeding brakes, I always try not to strip the bleeder screws because replacing one of them or other brake components is time consuming and it can be very expensive.